I'm Al Kingsley. Lots of familiar faces and plenty of new ones. So hello to everybody that I don't know. But um, it's great to have an opportunity to um, share with you all today. And um, it's a topic I've talked about before. We want to talk about global ed tech, um, but really recognizing with the changes that have happened recently, how, how now more than ever a digital strategy is really relevant and it pulls together lots of the strands you've heard today. And I wouldn't be taking the opportunity that I could without using Mr. Anderson for a few insights along our hopefully really rapid journey through um, this conversation. So I guess it starts with what is possible versus what you need, looking at your school being equipped for a digital world. And um, there might be a bit of a musical theme as we progress on our journey today. So <laughs> I'm going to start then with journey. Don't stop believing. Uh, and it is about optimism and about focusing on those key things that you need. So with that in mind, a conversation point that often has been discussed, certainly the catalyst of COVID in recent months and over the last year, has really been about what does a digital strategy mean to you? And it's a topic I share at different events and discuss, and you'll know Mark and I um, wrote a guide covering those strands. But there's a kind of a summary of all the different terms that kind of get encapsulated when we uh, when we talk with school leaders and with staff and, and across the board. We get that mix of it being innovative and exciting and looking forward to it and building on comms. But also, understandably and rightly, there are those daunting and confusing and those other concerns about how you actually implement it and what it means in terms of capacity and, of course, overall direction. So kind of with that in mind, I always like to start the conversation by saying sometimes you have to look backwards to move forwards. And what I really mean about that is, is the fact that, you know, schools are very reflective. And what in order to kind of move forward and shape a digital strategy, you need to start by understanding what has worked well so far. Have you reviewed what's been sustained and become embedded within the schools? What are our collective skills within the teaching cohort to actually leverage and build on any plans that we have? Do we know what's relevant in terms of how does it align with our school development plan? That will help shape priorities potentially on some of those aspects. Um, so very much a case of start by knowing what's worked well already, what's if effective and embedded, and then we can build on that. Um, you know, and that's the kind of key is if we know what's working well, we've got a sound, a solid foundation to move things forward. Um, another factor, another little clip here is about getting a grip. And what I mean by that is before we start looking at what could we add or more importantly, what do we need to add? We also have to have a sense of what have we got? What IT devices? Where are they? Are they being deployed and used most effectively? What software do we use? What subscriptions have we engaged with? And of course, that really key one that's been raised both within the school and our connectivity to our students is about our infrastructure, that sense of not building on poor foundations. So ironically, the more we know what we've got, the better equipped we are to think about what we need to, to build on and move forwards. So with that in mind, following our little journey, um, the mantra in our little musical theme here is that we need to stop, collaborate and listen. And where does our collaboration start? Well, surprise, surprise, at the heart of the conversation about our digital strategy is teachers and students. And yeah. around that, we of course need that input from the senior leadership and that alignment with our school's vision and our development plan. We need our network manager and IT team to be part of the conversation to make sure the things we want to achieve, albeit long term, aren't a surprise to them and we have the infrastructure. But no, it's one of the Venn diagram sides. It's not the central driver for this. Then, of course, we need to consider data privacy and not less than recent months where we've been looking at all sorts of different solutions. And we need to make sure we've got those data protection impact assessments or similar in place. We need to make sure it's inclusive for all our learners. So we need that send provision to be part of the conversation something very close to my heart and some of the technology we deliver, making sure your DSL and safeguarding is also there. The more we empower young people to have access to digital and technology, the more the onus falls on us to have those tools in place to keep them safe. Mm. And then we've got training in CPD, and this is probably a good point to, to speak to the master. So training hmm. in CPD, Mark, would you like to share a view on its importance? 
Well, yeah, absolutely. And I, I alluded to this in my presentation as well, Al, you know, because you're only ever as strong as your weakest link. And so it doesn't matter how great, you know, your IT setup is, you, may, you might have the most amazing technology available to you. But if you don't have adoption and confidence and competence uh, in, in the uses of these things, uh, then, then it's, it's, it's not an investment that's going to make any kind of return um, for, for teaching or learning, reduce workload, you know, um, cost savings on printing and all these different things. If, if teachers aren't um, uh, empowered to, to use the things that are available to them. Absolutely. And where it becomes relevant is our next bubble, finance. Not the old style approach, which is finance shape, what's available, so what should we do this year? Because we're looking at a longer term digital strategy. Finance needs to be part of the conversation. But that bubble, that training in CPD needs to be factored into that consideration, not just the hardware and software, the nuts and bolts actually the skills to get the most out of it and ultimately get what we're all looking for, which is impact. And finally, I always include, you want to have that oversight and challenge. Again, if you're going to have an effective journey, bring everybody along with you and make sure you've got that inclusive conversation. Sometimes though, it can be a bit of a tug of war and that's just the reality of it. So of course, we always kind of focus on that conversation about make sure you focus on the priorities over the conveniences. I appreciate sometimes an early win can help boost morale, but ultimately you want to make sure it's pedagogy focused, aligned with the school development plan. It's realistic within your capacity, not one size fits all. Every school will have different stakeholders and capacity. It's sustainable and you've considered ways that you can perhaps measure the actual impact. The more you can evidence impact, the easier it is to get buy in to extend and, and develop your digital strategy. Um, and of course, as part of that, confidence is king. And it alludes to Mark's comment really which is about great CPD being available and regularly embedded, not just perhaps once at inset and never touched again mm -hmm. on a particular product, making sure you embed within that the flag bearers. So other staff who can be the go-to people for different products and solutions. And then also thinking as Mark alluded to with that kind of four stages of teacher confidence, that survival mastery and so on. We're going at a fair lickety split. I'm conscious of your time, Mark. I will share the slides afterwards. Uh, communication is the key. You know, there's, a, there's a, another, it's been a few today, John Hattie quote there in terms of um, increasing student academic achievement, but never more than now. Looking back at um, Bookie's comments about from a SEND perspective as well, communication is fundamental, whether it's the communication layers we put in place between leadership and staff, school to student, school to parents and community, which has been another area where actually in some areas, there's been some real wins there in terms of schools uplifting that community engagement. And then there's that really big one, that well-being, that face-to-face, -face, that digital face-to-face, -face, those regular check-ins, and as Bucky referred to, the how are you as the starting part of the conversation. So that all builds into that. Now, I often put this comment up and people kind of think, well, that kind of contradicts your point of view a little bit, Al. EdTech's not the solution. And, and I really want to kind of stress, it's not the solution, but we don't stop the sentence there. It's a facilitator, a supporter, an empowerer. Nothing we share here replaces that the core of this is teacher to student engagement and their skill set and that role. But EdTech can be a really effective facilitator. However, we also need to make sure it's about those priorities and not trying to do too much when it's really not achievable. Mm. Um, I like to share this kind of vision for a school that's a digital world, you know, and it's a long old list, you know, everything from pedagogy being focused. EdTech's used where it's appropriate, but it's not forced into each and every setting. It's not a badge of honor that everything has to be techie. Teachers have confidence to use the tools, but also schools encourage and support teachers to have confidence to take risks, to try new things as part of that evolution. IT managers are at the heart of the discussion, but they're not the ones shaping it. That your digital citizenship and your safeguarding are all part of your overall long-term strategy, and that teachers have confidence to choose the right approaches, whether it's thinking for a certain setting, you know, these are the kind of things that you'll align with, Mark, you know, sometimes a, a mini whiteboard or effective post, pause, pounce, bounce questioning is just as effective as putting a bit of technology in place. So it's yep. about blending all those things together and it will be different for every school. Absolutely. Um, you may have heard this phrase before from somebody who's not that million miles away, um, but I think it's really important. It ain't what you do. It's the way that you do it. That real focus on sometimes we need to kind of make sure we reflect on the implementation of a small number of things rather than trying to do lots of things. Now, I also include this conversation because it links very much in with effective use of technology. But given that I've got Mr. Anderson on the stage with me, it would be daft of me not to ask you, Mark, to talk through something I know you're very passionate about. 
Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, it ties in really neatly because you were talking before, you know, teachers have lots of, um, uh, we've, we've talked about the, the confidence and competence thing. Uh, teachers have lots of um, experience in terms of their content knowledge. They have lots of experience in terms of their, uh, their pedagogical knowledge, but often, and what we see is they don't have that confidence and competence with their technological knowledge. And so a framework that's been really useful to me over the years is this one from Ruben Puentejura, uh, which is the SAMA model, which takes you through from substitution, where you might do something like note taking uh, and you might do note taking in a, in a notebook, um, in a notebook such as uh, one like this one here. Um, or you might choose to do it using a tool like this one here. Uh, but the thing is, the one from the other doesn't really improve or, or, or shift uh, learning or, or anything on. Now, there are functional improvements as we move through. Um, you, you get these functional improvements. You know, if, if I was making my notes on my iPad here, I can highlight it. I can underline stuff, all these different things. But I can still do that, actually. If I've got a few extra pens, I can still do that in my in my, my, my moleskin. So moving forward, what we can really then start thinking about is, is how we can do these things at a much higher level. So we can do things like we could collaborate on our notes and we can use the technology to do note taking in ways uh, that wouldn't have previously been conceivable. Uh, so that's uh, the sound model. It's been a great framework for me to get me thinking really about how I can really squeeze out um, all the opportunities for how technology can improve um, and support and most importantly enhance uh, what I'm trying to do with my learners in the classroom. Link to that, Mark, is the good old blended word. It means different things to different people. It's something you've shared some really useful resources on. So would you like to take the lead <clears throat> on this slide? Yeah, brilliantly. Uh, thank you. Al. And so you know, blending learning is really important. We've seen um, a massive um, uh, in increase in the knowledge of, of certain words and vernacular uh, during the last 12 months. Uh, certainly terms like asynchronous, where and this is uh, where you will uh, sort of um, uh, work in a more sort of project-based learning kind of way almost, uh, self-directed learning where students will go and collect the work when uh, and, and do work uh, when it's appropriate and uh, they're available. It was good for supporting some things. There are, there are advantages to uh, asynchronous approaches uh, and you can see those on the screen right there. Uh, but equally on the flip side, um, when you look at synchronous, um, which is sort of a replication of what you're doing on your average school day under normal circumstances, uh, you know, students moving from one lesson to the next, uh, down a corridor, the rest of it, you'll see the advantages advantages and disadvantages here of those two things as well um, and clearly what we found uh, during the course of the pandemic is that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach in the, you know you have to have all asynchronous or all synchronous what we found in schools around the world is over the course of the last 12 months when you start to think carefully about blending those two approaches uh, that's where you're likely to see more success so a polar approach is unlikely to be successful um, but a mixture of these um, two approaches kind of benefits for all Thank you, Mark, for being my sage on the stage. You can now become the guide on the side again for a sec. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to move across. One of the mantras you'll have heard lots of people share this is, you know, less is more. This is not a race to who can adopt the most ed tech as part of a digital strategy. It's got to be about doing a realistic amount where it's needed, where it's appropriate, and where it's actually going to meet a particular challenge that you have identified as part of your development process. <coughs> I did just mention my one bar there because chocolate trumps everything. Um, so 10 tips for working on an online class. And I've got a little Anderson pop out here because we've kind of shared these already from net support, but I'm not going to read them all out given time because you can, you can see them all there, but there are some of those kind of top tips for how to get the most out as part of that blended online experience. So everything from accessibility to keeping things simple, 2020, 20 rule and so on and so on. Um, again, hopefully that'll be useful for people um, post this event. So, one of the things is we take all those kind of concepts and how do we build them together? Well, within the two mm. multi-academy trusts that I'm chair of, we've kind of broken those down and we're not unique in this. We've, we've kind of looked and learned from all those other brilliant um, examples out there. Uh, Mark and I were talking last week on, on NetSport Radio with Linda Parsons and Paul Gardner at Deer International School. Fantastic plan that they've got and the way they've implemented theirs. But we've broken ours down really into our key pillars. So one being about reflecting on what we need to do or could do to innovate learning. One aspect in terms of developing students' digital skills. Another aspect about broadening and supporting the CPD teacher skills. A fourth one, not surprisingly, about the broader infrastructure and technology deployment that the trust uses. Focus on how we can use things most effectively to develop and support communication within the trust. And last but absolutely not least, to make sure that at the heart of these conversations, we're also utilizing our strategy to help promote and develop everybody's well-being. So if we quickly kind of whiz those down and we start with innovating learning, 
you know, innovating learning is really about reviewing the current use of ICT across the trust, the subject of where tech is appropriate, looking and doing a strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threats on devices, reviewing any supporting apps that can support our send, things like Immersive Reader, yeah, they are, looking at how we can do that blend between live streaming, recording content and exemplars for future access and clarity on how we deliver that remote teaching and learning. And I tend to put a few cartoons up because I think it just kind of shapes some of the, the initial considerations we have when we're sitting down thinking, my goodness, where do we go from here? In terms of student digital skills, well, a good starter for 10, and many of you, if not all of you, I'm sure will have done that, is undertaking those student digital skills surveys. So we can actually understand where those different gaps are, developing student skills with a core set of apps. Remembering that less is more, rather than trying to introduce 10 new things, looking at the core and the heart of what those tools are that will facilitate the most in terms of those initial wins. Building CPD for students, and I would argue for parents as well, when we think of our primary group, in terms of their core tools, whether it's Teams, Google, whatever they're using, and developing a strategy that builds around digital citizenship, because ultimately when we have our safeguarding and our concerns with that regard, the more we empower our young people to think and challenge effectively, the better. And of course, making sure within that we weave through it and we ensure there's accessibility for all. And then of course, alongside that, we're developing our digital learning resources for our students. Then we come on to our teacher skills and there's a long old list, but I mean, this again, I'm, I'm talking to, uh, to the converse on this one. Again, let's do a survey, a regular survey. So we have an open state of the nation, building on CPD, consolidating on key platforms across if you're a trust, all the different schools, perhaps developing things like monthly tech clubs, developing those flag bearers, online mm. resources, and so on and so on. Then we move on to technology and infrastructure. And again, there's some economies of scale here. And economies of scale benefit because they can unlock cash that can be used for the order of the day, the teaching and learning. So standardizing on trustworthy ICT platforms, looking at those economies of scale, reviewing online capacity and services, reviewing our data protection policies throughout the school, evaluating the flexibility of things like our assessment tools and our collaboration tools, reviewing disaster recovery, making sure we've got that continuity and a constant check and balance with, as we're looking at how we're developing and investing in hardware and services, how that aligns with the long-term view of our digital strategy. Communication, kind of focused on that being a key. And you know, at the end of the day, there's lots of different ways to communicate, but fundamentally it's about developing the use of your desired platform, establishing channels so that staff can have that fostered communication, both professionally and personally, promoting and finding the right way to deliver parental engagement, and delivering confidence and use of tools for those parents, building on a strategy for homeschool comms, uh, looks for ways to deliver training and CPD through an online portal, um, you know, and you can see Bookie was rising to that challenge earlier with some of the points she raised on there. We're going at a fair pace because I'm conscious of your timeline, Mark. Uh, next up yeah. on this one is perhaps not a surprise. Um, well-being is at that heart. We want to foster staff comms. We want to review the tools to help reduce teacher load, workload where it's appropriate, whether that's assessment tracking, building in rubrics to automate things, grading, feedback, taking audio notes rather than written notes, all the things that we can do, the small wins, marginal gains, but looking at reducing workload, reflecting on remote working versus the impact on well-being. This is a conversation we've had in our trusts. It's kind of assumed it saves time, but actually preparation-wise, it can create more overhead. Better support for SEND well-being with more face-to-face -face or virtual face-to-face -face support and interaction, providing easier access to online resources. Internally in the school, get more effective use of digital signage and messaging, celebrating success and positivity, and also developing a well-being group within the uh, within the trust. So they're all different strands to consider as part of it. And the bit that I think is really key is about developing champions for different strands within your school. The last thing you want is one person who is the all-knowing seer of understanding about products. From a strategic management point of view, you create real dependencies within your school or trust. But actually what you want is across the school embedded different flag bearers who are the go-to people with ideas to innovate and support different solutions. Yeah. Our quick tips. Mark, feel free to dip in on some of these. Get involved a fairly easy one. Yeah, I completely agree with that first one. I mean, we, we've had some conversation in the chat as well. Barbara's talking about involving librarians. I mean, we advocate for involving the entire school community in this process. Parents, you know, cleaning support staff, everybody should feed into this because there's benefits that can be gained across the board, uh, which sometimes aren't as, as immediately obvious. 
Uh, so do definitely try and get everyone involved in this and don't try and do things too quickly either. You know, uh, outwardly state this is where we're looking to get to, but recognize that we're on this journey together. We might make mistakes along the way. That's the approach that I always sort of advocate for. And and you said it's, uh, we, I've said this a few times today, and you have too, Al. It's so important to plan for loads of CPD because without it, you don't build that confidence that we, we need to see in our colleagues uh, so that things can go. And, and, and then, Make sure you have ways in there to measure impact because if you don't know, if you're not measuring what you're doing, uh, how do you know if you've actually been successful or not? So it's super important to, to do that and communicate things really clearly, not just with teachers, but with students, uh, with your governing body, with your other stakeholders, uh, some of which we mentioned before, such as Barbara mentioned with librarians and, and other support uh, staff and teaching assistants. Everybody needs to be involved in this process. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. So those are the kind of quick takeaways. Um, Given that I've got all of your ears and we've talked about how we can simplify and make things easy and accessible, one of the things that NetSport specialise in is that teacher to student interaction, that collaboration, assessment monitoring, and something that we've evolved over the last six months to, to reflect the challenges for school, both teaching in the classroom and with our children remote, is a brand new, easy to use teaching platform, classroom.cloud, uh, which really provides all the tools, perhaps more focused and, and different to some of the experiences of late is the ability to have your children at home, but actually better see on what's happening on their screens and interact with them so that you can shepherd the conversation along, launch websites and apps and actually bring them along as part of those synchronous learning experiences. Of course, the same tool you can use in the classroom. So we minimize teacher CPD. One tool works no matter what the setting. So if you get five minutes, I'd really encourage you, please go and check out classroom.cloud and hopefully it's something that will be of use to you at some point. And that whistle-stop tour of digital strategy, Mark, we've tried to cover all the key strands in one quick swoop. Um, there's a bit.ly link on the right-hand side there, which is a download link to our free digital strategy guide, version two, which not only has all the different thoughts and ideas, but is jam-packed with case studies from educators around the world with their experiences of how they've delivered that, uh, the challenges they met, and the solutions that they came up with. Uh, and apart from that, thanks for being invited today, and I hope everybody really enjoys the rest of the day. Keep safe, folks.